America is the indispensable nation, and we can do almost anything we want domestically and internationally as long as we believe hard enough. Okay, well, that may work in a, in a Hollywood script, but uh, in the real world where the enemy has a vote, yeah, not so much. And uh, we have nobody better to break down reality and what things are like actually on the ground than Douglas McGregor, retired Army colonel, uh, CEO of Our Country, Our Choice, which we're going to be talking about a little bit more later in this uh, telecast here, uh, retired, uh, a decorated combat veteran, former uh, advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Doug, welcome back to the show. Good to be with you. Uh, the, now, we're going to cut into that. And there's there's a lot of things that uh, specifically are related to that, as it, as uh, some things that have been said by a lot of our so-called senior leaders and, and leading voices out there that have a lot to do uh, with our national security, especially if some of our uh, political leaders listen to these guys. But before we do that, I want to touch on something that's really been kind of flying around the, the Internet and social media over the weekend and has a lot of people alarmed uh, and that is that Trump has uh, allegedly said that he'd let Russia do, quote, whatever the hell they want to NATO countries that don't pay enough. Now, a lot of the liberal media especially has been jumping all over this and saying, you know, man, he's literally going to let our uh, NATO allies go to Russia. In fact, some of the headlines even said that he's encouraging Russia to do that. And they, you know, oh, my God, or whatever. When you look at his comments in context, though, it's a little bit different picture. And we have this for you to watch. I did the same thing with NATO. I got them to pay up. NATO was busted until I came along. I said, everybody's going to pay. They said, well, if we don't pay, are you still going to protect us? I said, absolutely not. They couldn't believe the answer. And everybody, you never saw more money pour in to Secretary General Stoltenberg. Well, I don't know if he is anymore, but he was my biggest fan. He said, all these presidents came in, they'd make a speech, they'd leave, and that was it. And they all owed money, and they wouldn't pay it. I came in, I made a speech, and I said, you got to pay up. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. And the money came flowing in. So in context, he was talking about something that happened during his 2016 or his, his first administration. But, Doug, he's really been saying this simple or consistent message from the 2016 campaign all the way up through this speech here, which is that NATO doesn't need to be a freeloader. We don't need to just be doing whatever NATO wants. Uh, they should pay their fair share. Now, I want to before I hear your comments, I want to juxtapose that with the current president who seems to have, well, a different message. You can't tell me whether you're going to be able to go home tonight. No one can be sure what they're going to do. I'm saying as sure as anything can possibly be said about American foreign policy, we will stay connected to NATO. Connected to NATO beginning, middle, and end. We're a transatlantic partnership. That's what I've said. Now, I know that you you have uh, spent some time with uh, President Trump, and, and I know you worked some during his administration. Uh, a lot of people say, well, Trump is just using hyperbole. He doesn't actually mean that. He's just trying to show that he wants NATO to pay, pay, pay its fair share. But I think on the other side, you see that Biden is basically saying, if you pay, that's great. But if you don't, no problem. We're still going to do everything, which, of course, they're going to go, OK, cool. Then we'll still not pay our fair share and we'll just take your security. How do you see all that playing out in terms of what Trump said? President Trump uh, does like hyperbole. I mean, remember, he is, after all, a native New Yorker. And he, from time to time, uses language that perhaps others would not. You know, he, he likes to talk uh, almost in uh, gangster terms from time to time to make his point. Either you pay up or, you, or you're on your own kind of thing. But yes, he made the point that they, they certainly had to pay their fair share. He was also trying to tell them, look, you've got to be your own first responder. You know, warfare has changed. Technology has changed. The world has changed. The probability that we could move large forces across the Atlantic in any sort of reasonable time to make much difference out on the border with uh, Belarusia, that is white Russia or Russia itself or Ukraine, is just not reasonable. And we also don't have the forces that we had 33 years ago uh, with the depth and the equipment to do the job. 
So he was saying, look, you know, if you're, you you really you really have to look carefully at your responsibilities. And if you don't pay, uh, no, I'm not going to walk out of the NATO alliance, but I'm going to reconsider what we're doing. In the meantime, you need to be your own first responder. I think that was it. Now, Biden, Biden yeah. is, just, you know, signing up for no change in the status quo. That's it. He's all about no change. If you like the way things are right now, by God, vote for J Joe Biden. You'll get them and they'll be worse. Right. And, and you know what? I, I, I want to drill in on that point because I think it bears emphasizing that that almost never gets even mentioned to much less emphasize is that why should the U.S. be the, the first responder for the continent of Europe when they have all these rich countries there who should by all rights be providing their own first response? And they should be on their own accord making a, a military uh, equipment and, and structure and whatever to defend their country. And then if needed, then their, their ally can come and help over the shoulder. But it's like, no, they want us to be at the front and actually seems to demand that we do so. Well, keep something else in mind. Uh, and this is a point that we've that you and I have discussed previously and needs to be made again and again. Russia presents no existential threat to NATO or Europe. Now, back in January, February of 2022, uh, and that lasted until probably almost June. The argument was, oh, look at Russia. The Russian military is too small. The Russian military can't do anything right. The Russians are incompetent. Right. Uh, now, how do, you, how do you square this particular circle? On the one hand, you're trying to argue that Russia was armed to the teeth, ready to attack West and uh, conquer Europe. And therefore, we have to arm to the teeth to defend. On the other hand, you point out that, no, they, they weren't ready for anything. They were grossly underwhelming in terms of numbers and equipment. It, it doesn't work. And the point is now, you know, Tr President Trump knew that Russia presented no immediate threat to Europe whatsoever. And he was simply saying, you, you know, defend yourselves first and foremost. Be your own first responder. We don't expect Europeans to show up and defend the continental United States if we are attacked. So why are you expecting us to throw in 100% over a border dispute you may have on, in the East somewhere? But, you know, again, everything yeah. is misrepresented because, again, everything is about the threat to money. Everything in Washington revolves around the flow of cash. If you talk in terms, and frankly, I think NATO has long since out, outlived its utility, and you talk about scaling back your investment in something like NATO, that has huge repercussions inside Washington. Yeah. Look at all the phony think tanks. I call them phony because they're not think tanks. They're what I call advocacy tanks. That's what Chaz Freeman says. They're, they're just there to push for an agenda. All of these tanks will be out of business. You mean <laughs> we can't talk about perpetual war with Russia anymore? You mean the Europeans will actually stand up and do something independently of us? Even though they pay lip service to that sort of thing, the truth is they can't live without the dispensation of cash that comes from all these, you know, sacred cows that deserve to be slain. Yeah. And and that's a perfect segue into to what we want to talk about next. And in fact, the actual title of this segment here is The Deadly Myth of U.S. Invincibility. And one of the reasons why I was eager to have you on to talk about this, because you always talk about what's going on on the ground and, and the reality, the capabilities, what we actually can do what is, is going to be a big challenge and not just this pie in the sky that we can do everything we want to, uh, because it's not like we're weak, but we do have limitations and we have to be cognizant of those. Now, there are those in Washington, I know you're going to be shocked about this, that actually want to pretend like we can literally do anything we want and there won't be even consequences, much less a cost. And uh, first of all, I want to look at the situation uh, with uh, Iran in the Middle East and with the attacks on our troops in, the, in Iraq and in Syria and the, the lust that some people have to go after them into Iran, because you've been tweeting about this, which I'll hit in just a second. But as a setup, let's see what they're actually saying. And first of all, uh, I want to look at uh, Brother Jack Keane, who in this case will sound a little bit like a peacenik, because he's like saying, hey, no more war, with one important caveat. An attack on Iranian soil? Should that be part of the plan? It should be. Why, of course it should be. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're not talking about a go-to-war attack on Iran that w we've seen before when, when we lit up Baghdad. Nobody's advocating anything like that. When the administration says, well, we don't want to escalate, we don't want to widen the war, and no, no one wants a war with Iran, well, of course, no one's proposing a war with Iran. But holding around the carnival in terms of some of the IRGC assets, the leadership and their physical assets themselves, in a limited, measured way, makes sense and letting them know that we won't stop there. Yeah, I mean, all he's saying is this just hit their troops, their leadership, and their assets in their country, and there won't be a war. I mean, that's not a big deal. But then, actually, Brother Kellogg, uh, former General Kellogg, wants to go a little further. They have to do what I would call super escalate. They have to take it to a level that everybody's uncomfortable, including those in the Situation Room, where you go to a level, you say, okay, this isn't a gamble. It's a risk, and we understand the risks involved. But until we make a clear message, we send a clear message, these are going to continue. So you have to go outside of your normal box, and you have to break the escalation ladder. Either attack the Quds Force leaders, that's Ismail Ghani, or the Supreme Leader Khamenei, or the facilities they've got in Iran. But somebody has to make a hard call, because now we've reached a point where we're going to have to do something very hard, very strong, and the response is going to be probably... But the, from their end, it could be proportionate. So be prepared for that. That's that's uh, going after the head of state again. I don't think he doesn't want a war, but we can knock him out. So now I don't know this. I'm going to show one more piece here. But, and I don't know if you had Lindsey Graham in mind when you made these tweets, which I'll show in just a second. But this part, I think, was a little bit more over the top because the disconnect that Lindsey Graham seems to have with reality. Without Iran, there are no Houthis. The Houthis are completely backed by Iran. I've been saying for six months now, hit Iran. They have oil fields out in the open. They have the um, Revolutionary Guard headquarters you can see from space. Blow it off the map. Here's what we need to do. You need to hit something that Ayatollah values. His leadership team, like a Soleimani, or take him out of the oil business. If we hit their oil infrastructure, you don't need manned aircraft. They've got four refineries you can see from space. If you knock one of them out, they would stop this. If the goal is to deter Iran, you're failing miserably. So all of these guys say that we should conduct acts of war and bomb inside of Iran in order to deter them and to make them back down. But a couple of days ago, you tweeted these uh, these ones here, which you say bombing campaigns show that you are at war with an opponent. The assumption that we can do something without ending up in a major war is a false one. And then Washington knows that Iran is resolved to fight the U.S. if the U.S. forces attack it. An American-led strategic bombing offensive against Iran will produce rain of fire on the 57,000 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines in the Middle East. And then lastly, American policymakers must not be duped into believing that the U.S. military technology is unique or superior or that U.S. armed forces on land or sea are immune to large-scale precision strikes. When you write those things, Doug, and, and you hear comments like this, I mean, what's, what's going through your mind? Well, perhaps, uh, and I'm sure some of the viewers are wondering about this right now, perhaps General Keene has some sort of written assurances from the leadership of the Iranian state that they will understand that these are limited strikes meant to effectively uh, push Iran back into its quote-unquote box. I, I don't know. It could be that he genuinely believes that uh, he can do these things without significant strategic repercussions. Now, as far as Kellogg and, and Graham are concerned, uh, they're arguably far more dangerous than uh, Keene, although they're all equally dangerous simply because they don't understand the consequences of their actions. But Graham and, and Kellogg, and to a lesser extent Keene, all seem to think that Iran is a larger version of Iraq, that Iran is isolated, that Iran's equipment is antiquated, that its armed forces are weak and incapable that Iran can be bullied and, and pulverized the way we bullied and pulverized Iraq. Uh, I don't think that's going to work, Dan, but uh, that's their view. It's very dangerous. And as you point out, you know, let's set aside the United States Constitution. That's all, all obviously irrelevant. Plays no role any longer in decision making in Washington. There is a war party that is largely indistinguishable from the swamp, the Uniparty. The war party wants war. For them, this has been a very enriching experience. 
Uh, I'm sure that if we were able to get control or, or access to information about these various retired three and four stars who have been strong advocates for intervention and meddling in the affairs of other countries, we'd find out that they've grown dramatically richer in retirement than they ever were when they were on active duty. As far as Lindsey Graham is concerned, you could just look at his principal uh, donors to, to the PACs that support him, and it's no mystery that he's the darling of the military industrial complex. Uh, everyone is, is sees an opportunity here to make lots of money, but there won't be money to be made unless they're talking about rebuilding portions of the United States as well as Europe and uh, probably in the Middle East. In other words, we cannot act with impunity. If you start expanding this unfortunate campaign of assassinating members of other people's governments, by the way, we did that with Soleimani. I oppose that. Soleimani was a member of the Iranian national government. He was effectively the national security advisor to the Supreme Leader. He sat in on the, all of the council meetings. We killed him. We literally assassinated him. And that was a serious mistake in my judgment. Everybody would say, well, he killed Americans. Well, I, as I told one person, uh, what would we do if an occupying army were in Mexico? Would we help the Mexicans? Uh, I think so. And we'd like to see that occupying army the hell out of the Western Hemisphere. 